MSU football lands two massive commits for the offensive line, the Lineski brothers. That is right. And hey, all these new recruiting staff members, what on earth are they going to be doing at Michigan State? And that's right. Tis the season. It is time for some money ball. Let's go. You are locked on Spartans, your daily podcast on the Michigan State Spartans, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Spartan friends, Spartan family, Locked on Spartans listeners, thank you so much for tuning in to today's show of Locked on Spartans. Hope you're having quite a swell week so far. I mean, I think it's safe to say that as Spartan fans, we all are because all of a sudden, it's raining recruits. Uh, it has been a nice stretch for Michigan State here. We're going to be talking about the Lineski brothers here in a little bit. Also, though, hey... Coming up pretty soon, Justin Denson. He's going to be announcing his decision as well. Three-star safety out of Rhode Island. But, hey, we're going to stick to the trenches in this first segment. But first, hey, if you ever want to reach out, LockdownSpartans at gmail.com. And please rate, review, and subscribe to this here podcast or YouTube channel. All right, that takes care of the housekeeping. Let's talk about Charlton and Mercer Lanieski. And, gang, I'm already a massive, massive fan of these twin brothers, not because of what they bring to the table, not just because they add a lot of beef to this already impressive offensive line recruiting stretch Coach Kapilovic is on, but no, on Twitter, Mercer Lanieski has his pronunciation of the last name right there. And if you've listened to this show, if you've heard me try to say Ma Nauteote's name or Tumisi Adelaide's name or even names way easier than that. You know that pronunciation can be quite, quite the obstacle course for yours truly over here. But hey, Lun Yeski, we get to talk about them with the correct last name. But hey, enough about that. What do they bring to the table? Let's just start with the frames. Charlton, six foot five, two hundred eighty pounds, projects as a interior offensive lineman. His brother, a little bigger, six foot seven, three hundred pounds, projecting as an offensive tackle and has had a pretty impressive spring slash summer is what we will call this. He went to a Ohio camp hosted by Under Armour not too long ago and, well, just walked away from that very, very talented group with offensive line MVP honors. We're talking guys that are committed to other Big Ten schools. Okay, it was still better than that. And, look, hey, I mean, when has having brothers from Ohio – ever worked out here at Michigan State, right? I mean, it seems like the Slade brothers, they seem to work out. It seemed like the whole Dowell family seemed to work out. So yes, Charlton and Mercer are the next chapter in Brothers from Ohio to come to Michigan State. Now, what is in the offensive line class right now? It's Andrew Dennis, all right? Uh, a guy that might as well just be on the recruiting staff right now for Michigan State. I think he went up to Michigan State four times in June, one on an official visit, the other three times just on his own accord, just to preach to all the recruits to try to commit to Michigan State. And well, if you want to take last week's track record, seems to be working out okay for Andrew Dennis here. But anyway, six foot five, 275 player. Uh, also, you know what? Let's talk about this for a little bit. Had to add 25 to 30 ish pounds from when he started visiting Michigan State just to get that offer. And keep that in mind because that's going to be important to the thesis of what we are talking about here. Also, Logan Bennett, another offensive tackle commit, six foot six, 300 pounds. Now, hey, look, Coach Kapilovic is getting the guys he wants. Yes, you might look at this and say, okay, Matt, you just named. Four three stars. Aren't, aren't we trying to get four stars or five stars here? And well, sure, of course we are. Like DeAndre Carter still on the board. And no, I don't think taking four offensive linemen so far will impact DeAndre Carter's decision. I think it'll be USC's battle to lose still. But hey, if DeAndre Carter wants to come here, they're going to make room for him in this class with him. So no, I mean, just uh, since they already have four offensive linemen, I, I don't think that's going to impact his decision all too much. Anyway. Coach Cap is getting the guys he wants. He talked about not too long ago on in an inter interview on the SD4L show that offensive line projecting is probably the toughest when it comes to grading football prospects because, well, 
just like Andrew Dennis in this case came in. Okay, he's evaluating him at six foot five, two hundred forty ish pounds, uh, or two hundred fifty ish pounds, and said, "Well, we want to see you add the twenty five to thirty pounds because the hard part about projecting offensive linemen is wondering how they're going to carry and play with that weight once they add it on in a college weight regiment." Now, if you get a kid in here who's six foot six, but he's two hundred sixty five pounds, for example, and you want him to play offensive tackle. All right, hey, he looks really good at 6'6", 265, and uh uh-oh, he goes up to like 290, 295, and all of a sudden, he is not shuffling the way he used to. His agility has really slowed down. So Coach Cap is getting guys that already have the frame that they are looking for in college. They already have the college build, if you will. So when you look at guys again, like Andrew Dennis, 6'5", 275. Logan Bennett, 6'6", 300, and then the Lanieski brothers, I mean, who are already at a college size. Okay, that that bodes pretty well because, again, yes, do you want the four stars? Do you want the five stars? Absolutely, sure. But you could find the most diamonds in the rough with offensive linemen just because, again, you don't always know how they're going to translate from a high school game, maybe playing 20 pounds underweight, to finally when they get in the college game. And by the time they're juniors or redshirt sophomores, you know, the time where offensive linemen start to play, they look completely different in most cases than when they came to school. Also, let's just talk about last year too, because Coach Cap is on quite the tear in offensive lineman recruiting. Stanton Rammel, six foot seven, 310 pounds. Keyshawn Blackstock, of course, came from junior college at six foot five, 315 pounds. And then Cole Dellinger, six five, 280. And I also want to give a nod to these three redshirt freshmen preferred walk-ons here, Jacob Merritt, Ben Nelson, and Andy Hartman. Maybe three names that you've never heard of in your entire life. And hey, with most walk-ons, you'll never hear them in their four years here. But man, all three of those guys I just named, all six foot six or taller. And they are all going towards 300 pounds. All three of those guys have added 15, 25 pounds since last year. Again, we saw with Jack Conklin, if you want a familiar Michigan State name. Sometimes you can come in here as an unranked guy. And, well, hey, it's not just at Michigan State where that happens. And, no, I'm not just pulling, you know, a bunch of smoke out of my butt and talking about, like, hey, walk cuts can play with no rhyme or reason around it. Let's just go back to last year's all Big Ten teams. We're talking first team, second team, and third team. There were 16 offensive linemen between those three teams. Two of them, former five stars. Five of them, former four stars. Six of them were three stars. And then three of them were unranked. Again, yes, you can find diamonds in the rough at running back or receiver or court. Every position, you can find a diamond in the rough. There is a story for every position. It happens more with offensive linemen, though, than it does with every other group. And also... I do like that this is Coach Cap. He had six offensive linemen on campus in June for official visits. Right now, he has gone four of six. One guy is already committed elsewhere, four-star Nathan Roy. Okay, small bummer, but that's okay. The uh, the sixth guy is DeAndre Carter, kid from California. Uh, we'll see when he wants to make his decision. But yes, this isn't just... Coach Cap scrambling at the end of the cycle, being like, oh my God, I only have one guy. I only have two guys. I need to just go find someone anywhere. I'm getting desperate. Like, no. He had an eye on these kids from the start, got them way before National Signing Day on campus, and has four of them verbally committed right now. So, no, it's not scraping the bottom of the barrel. Coach Cap, who, uh, if you're going to trust any assistant coach on this staff right now with talent evaluation, Yeah, I'm going to trust that he knows what he's looking at with the four offensive linemen signed on right now. So again, hey, just going back just to put a bow on it, uh, the all Big Ten linemen. I know I'm jumping around here a little bit. That was a long way of saying that 10 of the 16 offensive linemen were either three stars or unranked. So there you have it. Just wanted to put a bow on that. Or will we? No, I think we're going to keep talking offensive linemen here in a little bit. That's right. This episode is for the Hogs. And this episode is brought to you by Fan Duel Sportsbook Gang. My favorite event of the year is coming up in Detroit. The Rocket Mortgage Classic. Already took my bets on Ricky Fowler at 14 to 1, Justin Thomas 18 to 1, and then sprinkled three units on Harris English at 50 to 1. That's right. If Harris English lifts that Rocket Mortgage trophy, 
I will not be doing this podcast anymore because I will be retired thanks to FanDuel Sportsbook. That's that's a lie. I don't really bet that much. Anyway, gang, if you want to get in on the Rocket Mortgage action this week, join me, especially if you're a new customer because you can get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. Hey, if you want to join in on the no-sweat first bet and then max it out on Harris English, you might actually make enough to retire. Who knows? That's up to $1,000 back in bonus bets. If your first bet doesn't win, just go to fanduel.com slash locked on to join today. Do not miss your chance to snag a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today, gang. Again, just go to fanduel.com slash locked on to sign up. It's FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Now, we're going to jump quickly into the mailbag here because, hey, going hand-in-hand hand with our first segment's conversation, offensive line recruiting, and Ray Ray writes out, hey, here's a question for you. Again, LockedOnSpartans at gmail.com, just like Ray Ray reached out at. This may involve you stepping out of your comfort zone. Oh, nonsense. Come on. Speculate. Uh, sorry. Speculate as to how well or poorly MSU football will be doing it in five years. Are we solidly in the Big Ten's top three? Has Tucker weathered the storm, or has he revealed himself as a job-hopping fraud? Will State put those pretenders in the bleep house back in their place, or will Harbaugh still be both irritating and successful? We'll work our way back here. Uh, will Harbaugh still be irritating and successful? Probably. I mean, it is going to be interesting in like two or three years because off those college football appearances – They've had objectively good recruiting classes, but not like mega classes that are in the top three, for example. So we'll see if like those good classes are going to be enough to sustain the level they're playing at right now because it's as high of a level I've ever seen them play at. So we'll see. Anyway, has Tucker weathered the storm or would he be revealed as a job hopping fraud? Uh, I, Tucker's not going anywhere, at least not in the next five years, safe to say, uh, even longer than that. I think what MSU did with him and trusting him with his contract contract. I don't think that we'll be in year six or seven, and then he'll be just leaving town just because I think he likes it here and he's slanting. Now let's get to the meat of the question here. Speculate how well or poorly Michigan State football will be doing in five years. Are we solidly in the Big Ten's top three? My guess is no. However, don't turn the show off yet if you're a Michigan State fan. I'm not going to be all negative here. Top three is going to be very difficult, right? I mean, it already is very hard. With Michigan, with Ohio State, with Penn State, Wisconsin's not going to be too shabby either, and I don't think they're going to skip any beats under Luke Fickle. And, oh, yeah, hailing in from the West Coast, Lincoln Riley and USC. Now, will I think there's going to be an adjustment period for USC? Perhaps. I still think they're going to be incredible. Uh, but, yes, traveling across the country for half your conference season – that's going to be fascinating to see how that unfolds. And yes, of course, the flashy, high-flying USC Lincoln Riley offense against the bones and grit Big Ten. Like that, that'll be interesting to see. But I trust USC's recruiting and the coaching acumen of Lincoln Riley to get it figured out. Now, however, what Michigan State is doing right now is the way to go if you want to bring yourself into the top three of the Big Ten, or let's just call it the top five of the Big Ten in the next five years. It is all about the trenches. And I think, you know, there's a good chunk of people that know this, but look, by and large, the, the fair weather fan probably has no clue how important the offensive line is to a football team. These are the guys that you might never know the names of if you're just a fan that you know, just tunes in every Saturday. You know, you don't subscribe to a message board or anything like that. You could go the whole year without naming one offensive lineman. But man, it every single year, once you realize how important offensive linemen are, it just reiterates itself as the years go on. Uh, look, we'll keep it to Michigan State. Those 2014 and 15 offensive line rooms were the most talented that I can remember. And oh my God, it's crazy. What a coincidence. They were also the two best years Michigan State had offensively. Funny how that works out. But also like just more recently around the country. Okay. Georgia, how are they doing it? All right, they had a walk-on at quarterback, and Stetson Bennett was fine by the end of it. But, yeah, when you're playing behind an offensive line made up of those guys, yeah, that's going to be okay. Same with Ohio State. I know that a lot of people look at their receivers and how flashy they are, but what's really underrated is how strong Ohio State is in the trenches. Or just look at Michigan 
last year. I mean, I'm sorry, guys. I mean, I know it's a Michigan State podcast, but if you want a good example of how important offensive linemen are, well, there it is right there. I mean, name a Michigan receiver. I, I, I quite honestly can't at the top of my head because they don't have any real flashy, so to speak, receivers. Guess what? They don't really have to. They can get it done in the run game. They could buy J.J. McCarthy all sorts of time because it doesn't really matter how great of a receiver you are. If you have like seven seconds back there to improvise a route, yeah, you're probably going to get open eventually here. And that all goes back to the offensive line. Also, hey, if you want to talk more about the Big Ten, it's why Wisconsin was always at the top of the Big Ten West. Again, you don't think of flashy position players for Wisconsin ever, all right? Yes, yeah, strong running backs, of course, but receivers? Strong quarterback play? I don't know about that, but they were always at the top of the Big Ten West. And I know that, look, I mean, if Michigan State played in the Big Ten West, they could easily do it, but that's how Wisconsin was able to do it. And in the years Wisconsin wasn't the team, that Iowa was the team, oh, hey, what you look at that, it's probably because they had incredible offensive line play. So, look, it's the emphasis of the recruiting classes the last two years. And something that we – I've been kind of asking about here in the Mel Tucker era is does this team have an identity? Like what is the identity of this team? Now you really hope that we're going to see it now. Okay. That first COVID season. Sure. Chalked it up as a loss. The uh, Kenneth Walker year. Okay. Yeah, that was fun. That identity was just hand the ball to a future NFL. Great. That seemed to work out. And last year was all over the board, but maybe the identity for Michigan state moving forward is going to be just trench play ground and pound Four yards in a cloud of dust. We're going to be run heavy and then bring it to the receivers when we want it to. I mean, there's plenty of teams that do that already, of course. We just named a few. But I think that might be the way that this is going, especially with recruiting going the way it is. So, yeah, I I don't think that top three in the next five years will be there. Again, it's such a far mountain to climb. But, hey, you, you see the blueprint of how Michigan State is going to get there with offensive line recruiting. So thanks a lot, Ray, Ray, for that question. Uh, He sent that like a week ago, but after this commitment week with the Lanieski twins, yeah, that just falls right into my talking points of how important offensive linemen are. Now, before going any further, sorry, we're going to turn the mood down a little bit. Um, Mel Tucker's uh, mother, if you haven't heard by now, Brenda Tucker, passed away last week, uh, six days ago at the time of recording, at the age of 74. And Mel Tucker, you know, came to Michigan State. A lot of appealing factors for his return to Michigan State. But one thing that he did point out was just how close it is to family. His family in Cleveland Heights, Ohio as well, uh, has tweeted about his mom, you know, ever so often. But yes, uh, 74 years old, passed away. And also, I just want to just point out, like, yes, look, Mel Tucker makes more money than I think anyone listening to this podcast or anyone talking on this podcast will ever make in their entire lives. Like, but man, college coaching is incredibly, incredibly demanding and incredibly tough. Uh, He learns this halfway through last week and he can't just get up and go to his family, you know, be around his siblings or the rest of the family. Maybe he made a day trip down there, but hey, by the weekend, he was there for the official visits. You know, he's here schmoozing eight high school kids just in hopes that they pick Michigan State. So, yeah, you can have more money than God, but there are some things that that's got to be a tough situation. So I just want to empathize with Mel Tucker there. I, I quite literally can't imagine that situation for him. But, yeah, just how many things you have to balance with actual real world, real family stuff as a college football coach, in- incredibly tough. So, yeah, just want to. Appreciate him for his efforts, too, over the weekend as well. Uh, recruiting did not take a, a break in, in the light of all this. And, yeah, so condolences to Mel Tucker. I highly doubt he watches this or will hear this, but just condolences to Mel Tucker, his family, and hopefully he does get some quality family time back home soon. Um, we're going to jump to the new staffers here because, uh, yeah, if you've been on Twitter or, uh, you know, the message boards like SpartansIllustrated.com or anything – 
There have been some names popping up as Mark Dethorn builds his staff here. Tyler Johnson, Jenna Learn, and Darius Hicks we're going to go through right now. Now, Tyler Johnson, she uh, will be the director of on-campus recruiting operations. She's from Jacksonville State, also did some work with Steve Sarkeesian at Texas. Jenna Learn, she's the director of on-campus recruiting. Uh, very young in her career right now, uh, has worked a year or two at South Florida after her gra graduation. And then Darius Hicks, director of scouting is his title. He joined this spring as a defensive analyst, but already at director of scouting. Now, what does that all mean exactly? Good question. I reached out to someone in the program and God, within a minute they responded. So really appreciate them here. Jenna and Tyler will tag team on the campus recruiting responsibilities and admin responsibilities tied to recruits like applying to school and transcripts and uh, maybe some uh, travel help with the coaches and also official visits as well. Now, Darius will be focused on the film study and evaluation of prospects, both high school and portal. However, it's not just these three people that's like doing their own thing and carrying the bulk of the load. Jenna and Tyler will also, and Darius as well, will have help beneath them in their departments. Now, the staffer I reached out to said that, you know, Mark is doing a great job getting us to an SEC level recruiting department. And those titles, like Director of On Campus Recruiting Operations, Director of On Campus Recruiting, I went and looked back, and I, I don't believe I saw those official titles in the past at Michigan State, at least in the side Khalif era. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's a lot of the work that they did last time around, but they are more defined roles and then a team under them as well. The team is bigger with the recruiting than it was, say, late stage D'Antonio, or how about just the whole D'Antonio era for that example. But yeah, there is a lot of things that are changing in the recruiting department, a different structure completely. And yeah, Mark D. Thorne, only here for a guy, I think less than two months now. I think May 1st is when he's, anyway, a few months. Already making a change here and, well, seems to be paying off right now. Now, someone did ask uh, in the mailbag. I did open up my Twitter, Sheehan underscore sports, um, with some mailbag questions. And then Junior hits me with a two-parter. You will not guess what this first part is. Number one, have you tried the Grimace Shake at McDonald's yet? Uh, no, I have not. Uh, no. uh, how are recent recruiting department hires learn and Johnson improvements over last year's staff? Both seem extremely inexperienced. Again, I, I wouldn't worry about the experience. I know it sounds a little weird because experiences take you a long way in life, but I mean, these are roles that are, you know, just more about relationship building hand in hand stuff. And when you work with a Texas, for example, like Tyler Johnson did, even just a year there, just seeing how everything goes, how the sausage is made there at a place like Texas too. I mean, God, even before NIL era and transfer portal era, like that was the craziest like department to work for from all stories I've heard. But yeah, that's going to be invaluable experience. And she comes up here. And again, D Thorne, he knows the ropes too. If they're reporting up to him, that's, that's who you want to have the experience. And he does with his stops. Uh, throughout his career as well. Quick little story about the shakes, by the way. I was a McDonald's employee in my later high school days and uh, first year of college. A little secret here about the shakes or ice cream. I know the joke going around is that like, uh, oh, hey, McDonald's ice cream machine is always broken or oh, I can't get a McFlurry because it's always broken. A little secret here. And I think I've shared this maybe one or two times in the show before. They're not... 95% of the time, they're not actually broken. Those shake and ice cream machines at McDonald's require so much cleaning. Because, I, believe it or not, contrary to popular belief, at least the one I worked at, sticking with the health codes and everything uh, is just gospel at McDonald's. So, like, you have to clean this machine, I think it was like three or maybe even four times a day. And that whole cleaning process of draining all the stuff inside and then filling it back up, getting it cold again, it could take like an hour and a half to two hours. So yes, next time you pull up to a drive-thru and, hey, say order a Grimace shake and they say, oh, sorry, it's, it's broken. Now, they're probably just doing their incredibly tedious and lawn, lawn cleaning process. So yeah, a little. how about that for Lockdown Spartans content right there? A little bit of McDonald's inside secret sprinkling for you right there. Anyway, hey, gang, back to Michigan State stuff. Moneyball is back. Holt High School 
on Thursday. Go and catch it. We're going to go through the teams right here. Now, there are about two Michigan State players on each of these teams. A.J. Hogard and Xavier Booker will be on the same team. Team Fago. That's already my favorite team name going around here. Team Nano Magic. Jeremy Fears of Michigan State. And then Ian Jones of Michigan State. If you already saw this, you saw Ian Jones, Michigan State. You might be a little confused. Ian Jones, graduate assistant at Michigan State. He played at East Carolina. Michigan State has added him to the staff and will, since he's fresh from college, he's going to be playing in this Moneyball program. And, I mean, this happens all the time where guys, you know, that graduated from college. Like on Team Nano Magic, there's a guy that graduated from Toledo in 07. He's playing. If you play college basketball, you can play in this. Team Snipes will have Jaden Akins and Madi Sissoko. Team Snipback Film Amplified, Trey Holloman and then Jackson Kohler as well. And Team Five Star Zone, Garrick Norman and Cohen Carr. And Team Goodfellas, Bagel Deli, Tyson Walker and Carson Cooper. I'm going to ask myself my own mailbag question right now. Who am I looking forward to seeing the most? What team? It's simple. I, I don't think there's a close second necessarily. It's team five-star zone. Moneyball is for shooting, and it's for highlight, real dunks. And, Will Joe, look at that. It's Garrick Norman, who has some bounce himself, but if you want the springiest rabbit of this whole recruiting class, it's Cohen Carr. You watch Moneyball, again, for like shooting, for athletic highlights, but also to see the freshman how they look, and then just make grand sweeping proclamations of what their career will be like in the future. And that is what we will do with this Moneyball session, especially with Team Five Star Zone with Garrig, Norman, and Cohen Carr. Now, if I did have to give a second place team, yeah, sure. Xavier Booker, AJ Hogard. Now, look, these like pro am style events, like these off season exhibition games, they're just overall like terrible events for big men, right? I mean, it's a lot of up and down the court. Not a lot of sex appeal on post moves where there's not a lot of defense. Um, so I don't know how much we'll see of Xavier Booker, but if he can splash home a few threes, if we could see his stroke looking good, okay, great, awesome. But, yeah, you best believe we will keep a close eye on A.J. Hogard, how he is doing as well shooting the ball because, I, hey, I, there's something about that errant money ball that makes everyone shoot like 15% higher than they usually do. And uh, we all get to get very excited about that. Now, some other few notes here from Moneyball. You may have noticed I did not say Malik Hall. Uh, if you remember, he had foot surgery a few months ago at this point. And um, yeah, you 100% don't play a kid in an event like this if he's coming off of foot injury issues, which is why I think my number one storyline for Moneyball is I just. Just don't get hurt, anyone, especially you, Jaden Akins, a guy that had foot issues last year. Okay, I, I I don't think they're stupid. I don't think they're risking anything. He's probably got a full, knock on wood, clean bill of health. But yeah, I that that's the number one storyline that I can have for Moneyball is just every Thursday night, just having held breath and just hoping that by the end of the night, everyone has made it out with all four limbs attached to their body. Now, something interesting that Moneyball uh, was tweeting about on their account is that they can't do streams. Well, they, okay, they said never say never about doing live streams. Like, you have to go to Holt High School. And why they can't do live streams is their first reason was, hey, we want this to be this authentic, organic event because this did start, you know, from the, gr uh, the grassroots, de like, I think decades ago now. I think they're up on 20 years now for Moneyball. No, excuse me, 18th year uh, coming up for them. But yeah, just, just keeping it organic, authentic like that. You know, you have to see it in person. There is a special uh, aura around having to do that. And then also, apparently, and this is from Moneyball, not me, uh, you have to go through, like, through NCAA stuff when it comes to Division One athletes playing in live streams in the offseason. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll take the word for it. And, yeah, so, but, yeah, so it's a twofold thing. One. It doesn't even seem like Moneyball wants to do that. And I can't knock them for that. Like, of course, this is such a cool event. Keep it to its roots as much as possible. And then, will the old legality uh, around that of, hey, maybe you can't live stream these Division One athletes. But, I, hey, again, Holt High School, uh, every Thursday going into early August. Uh, yeah, no shortage of great teams there. And God, I got to try to make it out this year. I have to absolutely try to make it out this year. This is Something I sadly have not done, and I really kick myself every year for not doing it, but maybe this is the 
year. All right, gang, thank you so much for tuning in to today's show of Locked on Spartans. We will be back on Friday. What are we going to talk about? Well, I have an idea, nine random thoughts on the upcoming season, but if there's any breaking news that climbs over that, of course, we're going to talk about that here, Locked on Spartans. Now go enjoy the rest of your week. Love you all. Go Green.